anybody figured out yet how how many people are singing when Chaopar sings? Have you figured out how the, the four of them can sound like a multitude which no man can number standing before the throne? Music of inspiration from the heart of God. Thank you, Mama's voice. Thank you. Thank you, Mama's voice. You know, I, 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 I still have gifts for you. Maybe, maybe I should give them to the, to the mammal's voice. But I don't have enough. So I think I'll give, where are you, Elder Paula? I, I, I'm going to give one gift today. Yesterday you learned a little about me. And uh, if somebody eases up on this mic, it's kind of live. Maybe if I fix this, it'll be all right. Yeah, yesterday you learned a little about me, and uh, you learned that my wife and I were born in the same month. Well, my wife has two brothers born in July, which I also do. I have two brothers born in July. So I... This, this thing wants to be attended. They're, they're always trying to get attention because they figure we are up front and nobody is noticing us. Are you doing the, pow the PowerPoint? It will fail. Although you've tried it, practiced it, run it through multiple times, then at the crucial moment it will fail. They, they are just like us. We, you know... We follow Satan, and it was pride that brought him down. So these appliances sometimes are so proud of themselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I have two brothers born in July. My wife has two brothers born in July. Is there anybody here from a family in which there are two boys born in July? No? No? Now, if I say one brother, 1,600 of you will put your hands up. Oh, oh, there's a mama saying one son, a son and a daughter. Come, let me give you the gift, ma'am. <laughs> give her a hand. Oh, oh, the gift is right there. Just congratulate her and give her the gift. Yeah. Wonderful. So maybe it is fair to give it to mom because the kids didn't have anything to do with their rate of arrival. And <laughs> it's the moms who do all the hard work. Today is mom's day, Sarah and Rebecca in law. And the aim of the exercise is to hype the distinction between God and random. And the reason is because Bible stories didn't just happen to be there. God has a purpose for them and for us. And so we're going to focus on individuality in the sense of personal choice demarcating destiny and highlighting what the purpose in this person's head when he does this, or in this case the, the, today, she does that. I am going to ask you to be patient and repeat the seven words that are the saying of the morning, or because we have another one this this afternoon evening, evening, don't throw any rotten eggs or tomatoes at me. Just be patient. Just, just bear with me. Just cooperate or oblige. 
especially if your name is Sarah. Because our summary of the day says, victory is for everybody. Victory is for everyone, even for Sarah. Do, do you think you can say that, Sarah? Ladies, women, can you say that or you need the men to help you? Because it, it really sounds like a this, you know. But let, let's say it together. This is the message. Everybody, victory is for everyone, even for Sarah. Let me hear you. Victory is for everyone, even, oh God, we thank you that there is victory for everyone, even for Sarah. Thank you in Jesus' name. On Sabbath, we spoke about the fall about humanity's original moral tragedy and two cousins who lived it out very differently. One of them went to heaven, literally. We're not speaking figuratively now. This is not metaphorically now. This is literally. One of them went to heaven. Because grace has always been available. I'm kind of sure that my mic is too live. Everything I say scares me because I hear it back so clearly. Although, okay, we'll keep going. One of them went to heaven because grace has always been available. Grace is as old as my beginning. On Sunday, we focused on choosing the right model. We talked about Abraham, God's hero, who succeeded in transferring to his adoring son Isaac a habit of dishonesty. And as you listened, you asked yourself, what am I teaching my children? I don't know how much of this is going to go on. But uh, one way or another, the message is going to go forth because the Lord has his way and it's always better than our way. What am I teaching my children? Am I making it harder for people to love and trust my God? And we summarized that Abraham was good, but only Jesus saves. Today, we are looking at individual purpose and human destiny. We are asking the question, does what you do matter? My dear and wonderful, brilliant wife had a brilliant assistant. Uh, I, not sure where she was from, or I think dad was from Uganda. Fongomudende. Anyway, um, her fiance had a theological problem. She worked for my wife. She confided in my wife that her fiance had a problem. So my wife told her to tell her fiance to go and speak with my wife's husband. Now, this is not gossip, but that is exactly how it was. My wife thinks her husband is a theologian. So the young man had a theological problem. So my wife told her assistant, his fiancé, to tell her fiancé, the young man, to go and speak with my wife's husband. The young man's problem was predestination. Not the biblical kind that says God has predestined all of us 
everybody he foreknew, he predestined through adoption in Christ to be part of his eternity family. Not that one. Another one. Not the biblical kind that says God is not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. He is now calling on humans everywhere to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. Come to salvation. That's biblical. I know and you know that a lot of brilliant theologians from Zingli to Luther to Augustine to Calvin, of course. Calvin is so much the, I mean, the master and boss and top dog in this thing that we call it Calvinism, although it was believed for long before him. This double predestination that long ago and far away, God back in eternity made a decision that he would bring some people here and have them live for a while and then say, okay, now go to the hot place. And some other people he would bring here and have them live for a while. Then he would say, come, come, come up to the cool place. Come be my friends. I, I, I hope he is not a mischief maker. You know, people who go around slinking like that and then come up and whisper in your ear. God bless you. God bless all the IT people in the world. God bless all the PA systems people in the world. Uh, without them, I would be nothing. So, I was saying that all these Brilliant theologians believe in this other predestination that God means for some people to go to the hot place and others to come and keep his company and chill out forever. That they also believe is in the Bible, which is very difficult to reconcile with not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance, whom he did foreknow, he predestined. I know what's going on in their heads. I know, I know. They have a hard time giving any credit to humanity because no human deserves any credit. And they're right on that. So they say God does everything and you're puppets. Well, I think that if they were to acknowledge that this salvation business is a God thing, if they would acknowledge as they need to, as we all ought to, that this salvation business is a God thing, they would be willing to submit their logic and reasoning and realize that human categories may not fit what we do is believe. We don't argue God out. We accept whosoever will may come. I'm coming, Jesus. There is so much about Christian theology, biblical theology, that just doesn't match with what it's supposed to match with. Was Jesus a man or was he God? Did Jesus die if he was God? How could he die? What kind of nature did he have when he came? Was it pre-lapsarian or post-lapsarian? If he came with a different nature from you and me, how could we say that he can save us? And if he had the same nature like you and me, how could he save us? So, I can't resolve it all, but I'm going to continue my story. It doesn't have much 
my story is that this young man believed in that kind of predestination and it was a problem for him so my wife got a message to him through word assistant that he should go and speak with my wife's husband about it so i asked him when he came to my office why would it be bothering him if he has no choice in the matter The conversation didn't go much further than that. If you have no say in the matter, why is it a problem? You can't do anything about it. The reason why it is a problem is because something inside of you says, I have a responsibility to think and act in response to the data, the information that comes to me. I have a responsibility. I have a duty. But they say, I have no responsibility. There isn't much to haggle about after you ask that question. If it, if it can be changed... What are you worrying for? You're worrying because you realize that you could make a foolish move and ruin everything that God wants to do for you. So today when we talk about Sarah and Rebecca and destiny, we're discussing how people confront issues and choose what they will do. We're talking about real choices and real people, two real human beings, two women this time. Not Lamech and Enoch or Abraham and Isaac. A mother-in-law, Sarah, and daughter-in-law, Rebecca. One strange thing, perhaps, about this story, today's presentation, is that this mother-in-law and daughter-in-law never met each other. Sarah died before Rebecca came onto the stage. So we're compa comparing people whose behavior mirrors or contrasts each other, whose actions involved and impacted other people, but not each other. Because Sarah wasn't around when Rebecca came along. And Rebecca was never around while Sarah was. You're dealing with people who choose to look like Jesus or to look like somebody else or something else. Let's do the Sarah first, because she's the mother-in-law. What do we know about Sarah? Yesterday you learned about Abraham, or we talked about what you already know about Abraham. So what do you already know about Sarah? She has two names in the Bible. The second one was given by God himself, and it means princess. What else? We know she was Abraham's wife. What else? We know she was Abraham's sister. Yeah, Revelation, Genesis 20.12 says she was Abraham's sister. But Genesis 11.29 has already told us that she was Abraham's wife. What else? She was barren. She couldn't have any kids. And, and she eventually menopaused. It's now a verb. She got to the place where even if she could have had before, now it was lights out. What else do we know about Sarah? We know that she was physically attractive. What else? She respected her husband. How do we know that? Well, when he had a bad request, she played along with him. She lied at his request. And apparently, it wasn't once or twice in a lifetime. Because when Abraham is speaking to the king of Gerar, he says, we made this agreement, wherever I go. And people want to know, she's my sister. How else does she show respect for her husband? Well, she also, in Genesis 18, cooperates in carrying out sudden 
urgent last minute instructions her husband is standing at the door of his tent he sees these three men walking along the sand in the heat of the day he was a madness come and cool yourselves guys and he runs around to sarah's tent he says do this get a calf and kill it and cook it up and bring it and feed and she what else do we know about her new testament first peter chapter 3 verse 6 says she called abraham lord I think I think the guys like that one. Number seven. What else do we know about her? She was ready to act a part. The same story about cooperating with Abraham's lie. She was ready. Anytime it came up, she she fell into the new role of sister. What else? Number eight, she's already outdone Abraham because we had seven on Abraham yesterday. We have 12 on Sarah today. One, two names in the Bible. Two, Abraham's wife. Three, Abraham's sister. Four, barren. Five, physically attractive. Six, respected husband. Seven, ready to act a part. Eight, she had her own ideas. Genesis chapter 16 says it popped into her head and she suggested it to her husband. Take this Egyptian woman who is one of my slaves. It was Sarah's idea. Nine. She respected God. How do we know that? You heard the scripture reading argument between Sarah and God because God says she laughed and she says she didn't she respected God because the record says she laughed to herself she just within her <laughs> he has no idea what he's talking about Sarah is a great woman, a great character here. Because in her culture and in our culture and in so many cultures, not being able to have a child, that is the end of your life. But Sarah could laugh about it. She was a remarkable character. Number nine, she respected God because she laughed to herself. Number ten, she disrespected God. Because she dared to... Lie! Now, this is not one of Abraham-initiated, programmed lies. This is Sarah for herself because she laughed within herself. But God knows. Now, we have problems, perhaps, with God appearing and walking about on earth. And some theologians say that that is the least spiritual of all the Bible's representations about God that the Old Testament writers of the Pentateuch had to deal with. The most simplistic and primitive is about God appearing and people being able to walk and talk with God. Do they know what they are saying? What does that say about Jesus? You see, my theological friends don't always think things through. You say that about the Old Testament. That's the most primitive, simplistic idea that God would come. And you still want to call yourself a Christian because Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, became a man. Anyway, Sarah respected God, but she also disrespected God. 11, she had a sense of humor. She could laugh. When Isaac was eventually born, the Bible says, Sarah says, I'll call him Isaac Gitzchak. Because this is a laughing matter. You know how old I am? This is my baby. Ah! She could laugh at herself. Number 12. Sarah has a place in the hall of faith. 
Hebrews 11. Sarah is named in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith. That is how we know that victory is for everyone, even for Sarah. Because the hall of faith, what is faith? Faith is the victory that overcomes the world, that overcomes age, that overcomes decrepitude, that overcomes disillusionment and frustration and sorrow and depression. Faith can pick you up again. Faith is the victory that overcomes the grave and bursts it open so that Lazarus comes out and all the dead in Christ to get up and come out. Faith is the victory. And uh, so we know victory is for everybody, even for Sarah. Here's my question. How much attention have you given to Sarah's existence and character in your sermons, your Bible studies, your offhand conversations? Apart from gentlemen, 1 Peter 3, 6, which we like because she called her husband Lord. What about Sarah? What is there about this interesting story about a real human being that denies her focus? When we know so much about her character. When so many fascinating elements of her makeup are documented in scripture. Did God intend for us to ignore and overlook and sidestep Sarah when he put her story into his holy word? No, he didn't. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, These things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the world are come. God doesn't think that you and I are puppets. God doesn't think that you and I are mannequins, that they put clothes on and then put them in a glass window for people to pass and look at them. God thinks we can learn and do better. So, he put Sarah's story into his salvation history book to teach us things we need to know in order to do better ourselves. Is there some specific reason, some specific good, some specific benefit to be derived from God saying, victory is for everyone, even for Sarah. And what would be the social, emotional, psychological, spiritual benefit of ignoring, overlooking, sidestepping, downplaying all this data about Sarah? Why don't we ask Sarah now a few of the questions we never cease to ask Jacob, her grandson, or Abraham, her husband. Sarah, what was it like to be barren in your culture? Oh, oh we don't need to ask her that one. She's already told us told us that Abraham's baby mama, Hagar, was her idea. So Sarah, you were no wallflower. You were capable of independent thinking. Eh, Sarah? And you were capable of pushing initiatives when you felt it mattered sufficiently. Eh, Sarah? A woman like you, Sarah, smart witty, sensually arousing, catching men's eyes everywhere you went from Egypt to Canaan. Tell me, Sarah, how well, how deeply, how thoroughly did you think through the possible implications of colluding with Abraham for the sake of his self-preservation? Because it was for him. It wasn't for you. He didn't think you would die. He thought he would. The entire scheme was to save his skin. Genesis 12, 11 to 13. My love, this is a paraphrase. I love, you're a beautiful woman. People 
will look at you and then they will look again. Inside their head, things will go crazy and the crazy stuff in their head will produce crazy action. They will kill me because I'm in the way of their passions. They will kill me and keep you alive so they can indulge their passions. How much of this did you process before you agreed with a man who was mainly thinking about himself? And Sarah, why did you agree to play this lie with your husband for so long? Decades and decades. Did you ever get tired of having to put on your show any time life seemed threatening to him? What would have happened if you had discreetly, tactfully, privately talk through with Abraham the implications of consistently lying to the heathen whom God wanted to bless through your example. Tell me, Sarah, were you simply intimidated and overwhelmed by this great and famous man who was your husband? How do you feel when men, strange men, foreign men took hold of you and brought you into their harem because your man Abraham was more committed to his own survival than respect for your body. Respect for your person, for your dignity, for your personal moral principles. Tell me, what was it like living in those palaces? What was it like when they let you out? When God commanded them to set you free, what did you think about him? Not Abraham. What did you think about God? When he ordered strange men to free you after your own great and holy husband had given them permission to use you. What might have been if all the peoples of your ancient world could have said, we trust the God of Abraham because Abraham always tells the truth. We trust Abraham. I mean, even if they couldn't say the God of Abraham and Isaac and uh, Sarah, we trust the God of Abraham because we see consistency in the lives of his children because look how they treat their women. You know you can't blame God for this, Sarah. Who knows how much he longed to use you and you never really gave him the chance he needed and deserved to use you to show his glory, his integrity, his independence, his morality. A lot of good Adventists who expect children to stand up to their parents when they hear the gospel at an evangelistic meeting. But no woman dare stand up to her husband for the sake of morality and Jesus and integrity and divine principle. Where do we get our theology? We get from Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was great and godly and Sarah called him Lord. We pick and choose the things that will suit us and put it in anybody's face who wants to challenge our lack of integrity or our complicated morality that allows us to save our lives at the expense of our wives. God have mercy on me. I need to stick to scripts because it diminishes the number of wrong things I say. Don't tell me, Sarah, and don't tell anybody else that, oh, well, you know, stuff happens. Or that God predestined you to let him down. Or that you're a puppet. Don't tell me, don't tell anybody, God or the devil or your husband. Don't tell anybody 
Well, stuff happens and you play along. It's not random stuff, Sarah. This is a mind and character at work. This is a will, decision-making faculties functioning to the max. And I'm going back to the Hager story, Sarah, because you look really bad in it. How well did you think it through before you pushed it to Abraham? Might you have gone that way if you had contemplated the madness that will still be blighting the world 4,000 years after your life and death? Middle Eastern struggles and chaos today are only a reflection of your own Sarah Hagar. Boxing match. You got your idea? You pushed it with your husband? He agreed? Why not? She got pregnant? You couldn't stand it? Oh, she was showing off too. Well, you couldn't stand it anymore. You complained to your husband. He said, this was your idea all along. You can do what you want. You threw the woman out of the house. You drove her out of the house with her son. God found her and made her come back to you. And you had to take her in and watch her come to term. Watch Abraham love his son. You helped him get while you were boiling and steaming and fuming inside. That was a bad story, Sarah. Nairobi Central Adventist, why do you think God put that story into his history book? And finally, what do you think he means by victory is for everyone, even for Sarah? You think some man or woman can learn a little lesson about runaway human passions and human nature and living the law of the land instead of the law of God? It was the law of the land that Sarah was thinking. What she did was legitimate in her time. Give this woman to the man, he'll get the baby, it will be counted as yours and you can bring up. The... That was the law of the land. You know? It's not in the sermon here, but Ellen White says, we know all the stuff that God says about Abraham having to take a three days journey with his son because God woke him up early one morning and told him, go and kill your son, your only begotten son. But I have Ishmael. No, 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 no. You and I understand. You have one son. Go and kill him. On a mountain, I will tell you all. Ellen White says that that agonizing mystery open to angels stuff that they didn't understand before. But the same inspired writer says Abraham had to go through that hell because he knew God's law thou shalt not commit. Adultery, and that was the trial of his soul. So that by trial, he could come forth as gold. He eventually passed the test. You can't excuse it because it's legal or because you have legal backing. That doesn't make it right in the sight of God. Now, Sarah, I know you've never met your mother, your daughter-in-law, but she was just like you, only better or worse. You never met her, so I'll have to tell you about her. You had a favorite, and she had one too. You thought yours was reasonable? And she thought hers was too. You wanted to make sure the wrong guy didn't end up inheriting all the promises God made to Father Abraham. That's the argument you came up with when you saw them playing together. You told Abraham, get this woman out of here, get this guy out of here. He is not going to be my rival to the promises that are promised to my son through you, his father. So Sarah wanted to make sure that Ishmael did not inherit 
what she believed Isaac was supposed to inherit and Rebecca wanted to make sure that Esau would not inherit what she believed Jacob was supposed to inherit. I'm not taking sides. I'm telling you a story. Rebecca, Sarah, was either better or worse than you because you were looking out for your son over against the son of a woman you suddenly started to call the Egyptian. Well, you didn't always say it in any contemptuous way, but somehow identifying the poor woman as Egyptian was like a this. Anyway, so Sarah, you were looking out for your son instead of the Egyptian woman's son. And your daughter-in-law was looking out for her son too. But you may have been looking out for your son for less noble reasons than she. After all, in her case, both of the boys were her boys. But she was looking out for her son for God's sake. Because God had said that her son, her favorite son, would inherit the birthright. They were both her sons. You were beautiful, Sarah. And she was as beautiful as you or more. So it's a good thing the two of you never met. She was as quick and calculating as you were quick and calculating. She made her man do things he would never have done on his own. And you made your man do things he never thought of until you came up with, with the stuff. She had her orders from God. The Lord said to her, Genesis 25, 23, two nations are in your womb and two people will be separated from your body. One will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. What's this about older and younger? They're twins. They're the same age. Anyway, God has spoken and he's made some kind of distinction and I'm on his side. Jacob came out second, so he must be the one God means should be the boss. She didn't just like Jacob because he came out second. She liked Jacob because Jacob's makeup and temperament attached him to her in a way that Esau's did not. Esau was an independent hunk and Jacob was a mama's boy. And so his mama loved her son. Forty years go by after God makes this prediction, the elder will serve the younger. And one day, she hears her husband Isaac telling Jacob's brother Esau that he's going to give him birthright. They're going to have a birthright party. Isaac sends Esau out to hunt, cook, bring him a plate, and he would give him the blessing. No way! Rebecca takes control. Rebecca and uninspired common sense, woman sense, take over. It's not good that they connect us with the animals and the instincts of animals. But those maternal instincts in animals and those maternal whatever, because it's human, is more than just instinct, but a thousand men can't do it. A thousand men don't understand. This has never been part of them except the little fine kanchi kanchi thing that came out long, long, long ago and the two of them met and something. Once it started, she was carrying everything. And when she carries them, whether it be full term or not, there's a connection between them and her that never operates between you and them. We are fathers, we are husbands, we may as well be honest. God programmed it that way. And there is no sense of rivalry and competition, but we introduce it. And if you want to introduce it, the men lose. So Rebecca's maternal instincts take over. 
on behalf of her little son. The Hebrew keeps using the word little. Now the word little also means younger. But when it is used in this context and we see the struggle that's going on, we realize that this is Rebecca, the mama bear, taking care of the baby bear. Rebecca dominates the story. Even when Isaac is speaking to Esau, the Bible story turns to Rebecca deliberately to show that she is the crucial eavesdropper. Here's the idea in a few words. Genesis 27, 2-5. Isaac said, Listen, son, I'm old. Not too sure, but I may die soon. So, take your hunting gear Go out to the field, shoot me something, stew it up like you know I love it, and bring it to me. I'll enjoy the meal and give you the blessing before I die. But Rebecca was listening. This is my paraphrase, and it is fair. It is not, it, it is not uh, extremist or idiosyncratic. Especially that last phrase, but... It isn't consistently translated but in the versions. But when you appreciate the conflict that is raging here and what is happening and will happen next, you realize that this vav is a contrastive conjunction. But Rebecca was listening. And then the story becomes the story of the crucial eavesdropper. And when it becomes her story, she dominates it in a way. What? Hmm? One element of her domination. When Isaac is telling Esau to go and do thus and so, and then come and I will give you the blessing, he gives Esau four imperatives. You know what imperatives? Words of command. He uses four words of command. When Rebecca takes over to make sure that things go right with her and her little son, she gives seven commands. And one of them, she uses twice. And it is the verb, obey. You do what I say, she says to Jacob. Or maybe... Do what I say, son. But whatever, it's an imperative. Esau gets four, Jacob gets seven. And of course, it isn't just that seven is more than four. It's like this is the ultimate perfection of human woman control. Seven commands. Rebecca is not a puppet. She's making decisions. She's doing something. She's completely swallowed up in this work of spiritual manipulation. Jacob raises one pathetic objection, or maybe you could call it a warning. If he is caught in the fraud, he says, quote, it would bring down a curse on him rather than a blessing. To which Rebecca promptly responds, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say or just obey me. The Bible is a story about God and people, folks. We're done. We are closing it up. God has a specific goal for himself. And that goal is disclosing his eternal undying love. And he has a specific purpose for us. And that purpose is to save us forever. That is why we have the Bible. To save us forever forever without breaking our will somehow in the eternal conception it is both possible for all to be of God and for those who benefit from it to have a say in it it isn't that we contribute anything. It is that grace will always be more than our reasoning and rationalizing. Grace will always top 
and surmount and transcend all our calculations. And God, by His grace, finds a way to save us, even Sarah. And sometimes we take critiques of Scripture from people whose forte is intelligence. From people whose strong point is brilliance. They may not be literary geniuses. They may be astrophysicists. But they can tell us, oh, the Bible is a biased, patriarchal, one-sided uh, document from a time of semi-civilization. Now we are much more enlightened and uh, we know better stuff. And so, we don't read our Bibles as carefully perhaps as we ought. And we accept what's the going thing. And ignore the fact that a natural man, I think it means person or human being, but it says man, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. My sisters and brothers, how will you evaluate and comprehend the world and the word of faith if brilliance is what matters most for you? And God says, I cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of me and I give you faith. I give Romans 12.3 to every human being a portion of faith and faith is the victory that overcomes the world after all the questions we posed to sarah after we have shamed her because we can see her better than she could see herself what do we do next because to whomsoever much is given of her of him shall much be required you know what Sarah is in the hall of faith. That hall of faith, chapter Hebrews 11, names 17 individuals, 16 of them affirmingly. Cain only gets in there. He's only mentioned to highlight the difference between him, faithless Cain, and his brother, faithful Abel. But all the rest are people whom God is signifying are victors by faith. And of those 16 plaques and headshots stuck against the wall there, hanging along the wall there in the hall of faith, out of 16, there are two women. One of them is a harlot, a whore, and the other one, is Sarah. Sarah and Rahab. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. I didn't like the idea that first hit me when I read the text. But it's because I read the text wrong. That's why I beg you to be patient with me. When I first started, maybe this never happened and never will happen to you, but when I first started focusing on it, it sounded like a wrong against Sarah. What do you mean, even Sarah? Why should God say, even Sarah? Isn't God just playing into the hands of the critics who denounce the Bible because it's always demeaning matriarchy and celebrating patriarchy wouldn't it be better just to leave her name out than to say even Sarah and then I discovered what even Sarah means because when God puts the question in chapter 18 of the book of Genesis God says, what is puzzling you? 
I said, Sarah's going to have a child. And you don't believe it. She doesn't believe it. What, what is your problem? That is what even Sarah means. It means that what is a problem with you is not a problem with God. Here is Sarah despairing among her fertile peers and eventually too old anyway. So Sarah laughs to herself saying, know that I am withered. That's how she speaks about herself. She's fine and happy. I'm a withered, dried up old woman and I can laugh. Now that I am withered, am I to have enjoyment with my husband so old? That's the Jewish Publication Society translation of Genesis 1812. And I bet you they know how to translate it. This is their language. But then God comes in and speaks up with his rhetorical querying, Is anything too wondrous for the Lord? And this word here is a word that God uses to identify himself to the Manoahs. Remember the woman got an appearance, a revelation, and she ran and told her husband. And uh, he figured that because he was the man, he had a right to have a personal appearance from God's messenger too. And so one day the, the angel came back to talk to the woman again. And she ran and brought him. And uh, he said, and the angels, do what I told the woman. And then he gets scared. And his wife tells him, what are you afraid of? If God wanted to kill us, he wouldn't accept our sacrifice. And God says in that encounter, what do you want to know my name? My name is, the King James Version translates it, secret. The Jewish Publication Society translates it, unknowable. New American Standard Bible Update translates it, wonderful or incomprehensible incomprehensible that is what even Sarah means it means higher than your highest human thought can reach is what God wants to do for you all you need is the faith that he gives you so Sarah does get pregnant because nothing is too hard for the Lord Sarah does give birth and she does laugh when God bless the world with more laughing Sarah's because nothing is impossible for you and Sarah comes to believe and what is incomprehensible from the human point of view gets done that is what even Sarah means to the ultimate stretch of your hoarded resources, God's giving is only just beginning. Victory is for everyone, regardless to how far you have fallen, regardless to how stubborn and perverse you have been, regardless to whatever devil deal you believe you have made and so God can't take you back that's the same devil you made the deal with lying to you because he is hopeless you are not victory is for everyone even for you who wants that victory today who you want to pray about it let's all stand together and if you want that victory today come to the front let's pray you want the victory in Jesus. Come, let's pray about it. Come, shake my hand and let's pray about it. You want the victory. It's not easy to come. You have to go backwards and forward and careful how you step and trip. But come, God bless you as you come. You need this. And it's available. Even for Sarah. I.e., no matter how far you've wandered, you know. I buried my sister-in-law in... -law in in March, in Guyana. And they've got all these wonderful kids. And all these wonderful kids have wandered away from their father's God and their grandfather's God. 
And four of them said they wanted to sing at the wedding, at the, at the funeral. What do you think they sang? I wandered far away from God. Now, now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've tried. Now I'm coming. Now i come. No matter how far you got to walk, even you, God's grace can reach. Coming home. Coming home. Never more to roam. Hold somebody's hand. Open wide, open wide thine arms. Now I'm coming home. Oh God, we thank you for Sarah today, even Sarah. Because now we understand you aren't saying... Well, she's some scrawny bit player, but I can give her root. No, no, no. You are saying Sarah is the ultimate demonstration of divine omnipotence. And that which to humanity is incomprehensible, you can do. Look what you did for Sarah. Do it for me, O oh God. Do it for every Sarah on this platform. Every Sarah in this audience and every Jacob, every Sarah, and Rebecca, and Isaac, and Abraham, and Tom, Dick, Harry, Mary, Obasanjo, Ernie, Young Kyung, Pyong, every, do it for us, O oh God. Because today, we admit, I'm not a puppet. I can make a decision for Jesus. And today, I do it. Because victory is for everyone, even for me. We thank you, dear God. Keep this thing going for the honor and glory of your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you all. falling down. Thank you. Encamped along the hills of light, the Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall fade the glowing skies against the foe in vales below. Let all our 
strength behold faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world faith is the victory faith is the victory behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all got about. The earth shall tremble beneath the tread and echo with a shout. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name, confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love of will vanquish you the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. great and loving Father in heaven, what a privilege to be in your sanctuary. What a privilege to listen to your word. Thank you for the wonderful words of life that we have heard. Thank you for the speaker whom you have used mightily to speak to us. May these words, O oh Lord, sunk deep in our hearts. And that, Father, we may be transformed and walk according to your will. We pray for thy forgiveness, but we thank you for thy grace. Amazing grace, grace that is greater than our sins. May you, O oh Lord, be with us even as we disperse. Continue to bless the programs that are even before us this afternoon. And may thy holy name, O oh God, be glorified in heaven and on earth below. As we leave this place, we pray that you may be with us and bless all the people who came and the visitors whom you have sent to come and speak to us. Father, prepare them mightily for the programs that are before us. It's my humble prayer in Jesus' name. We've come to the end of this morning service, and I now invite Elder Kiplimo to give us a highlight of what will the programs for the afternoon, Elder Kiplimo. 